The Software Defined Networking and OpenFlow webinar was made possible by the sponsorship of Big Switch Networks. Big Switch Networks are developing an SDN application for network virtualization, and you can get their open source SDN controller called Floodlight at the openflowhub.org. You can find Big Switch at bigswitch.com. This webinar is just one of many vendor independent data center and virtualization webinars available on IP Space. To learn more about them, visit ipspace.net. And don't forget that you get immediate access to all of them with a yearly subscription. What can flow tables do? So let's let's dive into some sample sort of entries in a flow table so you can imagine what it is that flow tables are like. So first of all, the thing to think of with flow tables, and this is a bit backtracking a little bit, a lot of people think that every entry in a flow table is explicit. This source MAC address to this destination MAC address, this source port, that destination port. In fact, it's not necessarily true. Reality is a flow table is often just full of wildcard entries. So I just wanted to point this out here and say in this particular table, for example, we're saying for any source MAC address with a MAC destination of 0002 in hexadecimal, then just send that out port one. Not a very practical rule, but you get the idea. In line three here, you can see here that I'm saying any MAC address, any, any MAC source destination, for any source IP address, route it to 10.2.2.1. Now, this makes, uh, this is simple destination forwarding, isn't it? Why not just send that out to port three and let it go. So it doesn't really matter. So in this case, we're actually saying for any Ethernet, we don't know about the Ethernet, for any source, if you're sending it to 10.2.2.1 on port 80, we're going to forward you out port 3. Now, in this case, you might, uh, you know, oops, pardon me, and so on and so forth uh, in terms of the flow table. So what I was trying to say here is that you know, it's not necessary to fill out all of the fields. We just have wildcards, subnet masks, flow fields, whatever you like. So let's have a look at the case of layer three routing. In layer three routing, we really only have flows that match destination IP subnets. So any MAC address from any source address to an IP destination of 10.1.1.0 slash 24, send it out port one. And then again on line two, we send it out of port two. This is destination routing. Now we're actually destinating routing out of port two. And then the third entry here could be considered a default route potentially. So we have just created a flow table which says route out of port one if you're going to 10.1.1.24, route it out point to port two if you want to go at 10.1.2.24, routed out port three if you want to follow a default route. Pretty straightforward. Let's get it to do the same thing with switching. We want to to do this, we would have to have all the MAC addresses in the network. But for now, we can set flows with wildcards except for the MAC nation, for the destination MAC address. And that's what switching is. Switches on destination MAC address. So for any MAC source, we can have it you know, MAC destination of dead beef, send it out port one. For MAC address of CAF BEDA, send it out of port two. And for any other frame where we don't know the source or the destination, send it to a controller so that the MAC address can be learned. And that, of course, is the other big part is that every MAC address must be known in the network for it to be forwarded to. In a normal switch network, an unknown MAC address is broadcast to all other out all ports except for the one that it was received from. This is how you achieve MAC learning in a flow, in a pure flow network. You might choose, of course, as I said earlier, not to do this. You might choose to let MAC learning, MAC learning occur in the normal way. So if we wanted to create virtual switching through a network, we don't need to tag, right? If all of the flow tables define the forwarding path from a port to the other, because the controller contains all the data in a central area, we don't actually need to tag it, because the switch doesn't need to have a marker to say 
that it goes from end to end. Now that would be true, right, if you actually were only matching on IP address. But if it would not be true if you are matching on source MAC and destination MAC because they are unique globally. So it's not necessarily needed to create virtual switches a la MPLS style if you want to tunnel something across a network. You could actually combine MAC addresses into flow groups to create virtual switches. So if you know that this MAC address is part of this group here, and this virtual network and that virtual network, then you create flows that match those two together. And of course, you can grow a virtual switched environment to as large as you like by combining groups of MAC addresses into flow groups. And this perhaps is where OpenFlow will be most successful because it is hard to describe because the data center is the thing that needs new virtual networks. So if you can imagine in a data center, you want to actually say this MAC address talks to that MAC address regardless of where it is in the network. That's my rule. You have a virtual server inside of a virtual, you have a guest, a guest server inside of a virtual server and that guest might move from box to box to box. And as it does, the controller would know about that. That is virtual switching and that is probably the first most important application of low open flow in the industry today. What about uh, flow tables acting as a firewall? Is that certainly possible? Well, sure, because what does a firewall do? Uh, I'm a little, you know, a little well known for saying that a firewall is a router that does not work. In other words, it either permits or denies via source or destination IP addresses. That's really what a firewall does. Unlike a router, which really permits by destination IP address as its standard condition, a firewall does a permit or a deny, usually a deny, by source and destination IP address. That's really all a firewall does. It's source destination routing in a way. It performs some reverse path forwarding, checks the inbound and outbound interfaces match the routing table. Most routers do that today. But it also maintains state for the reverse flow, so that when the, the destination receives the inbound session and initiates a reverse flow to exchange data back with the client, then a firewall actually has an algorithm that maintains state for that reverse flow. So what does that look like in a flow table? So here I've created sort of a, a rough flow table which says, for us in, in row one, which says 10.1.1 to 10.2.1.5 on port 80, drop. Now that would be a firewall rule, would it not? But the next one might be 10.1.1.2 to 10.2.2.1 on port 80, send that out port three. So allow this. And of course the logical extension of course is to say, send everything to a subnet, from this subnet to that subnet, allow it. And finally, the last one is to drop all. Now, the final piece of this puzzle, of course, is how do we do the reverse flow? So what you really want is actually not a drop all rule, although you do. You also need to say, if I am dispatching a, a frame, I need to signal it to the controller to do stateful packet inspection. So every time you create a forward flow rule, you would need to create a reverse flow rule and that would need something to be dispatched to the controller. I haven't shown that here because it's a little hard to explain in this particular format. But obviously to achieve stateful packet inspection, you should actually be saying to the controller, I just created an outbound rule. Now I need to create a reverse rule. So you'll need to signal the controller that something's occurred and then it would need to load a reverse rule back for the flow to say 10.2.4. star returning to 192. star it actually wouldn't be as wide as that would need to be quite explicit to match the reverse flow. The opportunity today to use flow tables for firewalling is a little limited. Having said that, people are working on it. What about a sample flow table for creating multipath applications? We talked earlier about multipath really being a challenge with OSPF or you know existing routing protocols today because it's very difficult to balance a session from one side to the other. But if you can create a flow table that says this source and destination goes out this side and this source and destination goes out the other, you can actually use a controller to rapidly iterate over those destinations and be continuously load balancing flows between two possible paths. That's one way of doing it. 
So you can actually have flow tables that say choose port 1 for this flow, choose port 2 for that flow, and have the controller continually intervening and updating the table and rebalancing by you looking at the utilization of the outbound port and saying I've got an overload on the left or an overload on the right, and then continually reconfiguring the flows. And this reconfiguration process is very valuable uh, and is a big feature of OpenFlow because obviously if you're programming an entry in a fib, there are no root flaps. There's no uh, problems with packets being black holed while a reconvergence happens. Provided your controller is tight enough and organized enough to deliver answers back to the system, then it will do its thing. It will continue to do what needs to be done. So path one, path two. So what we're actually doing is selecting a flow out to port two, but the rest to go out some other port or through the system. And in this case, the final one is to stay local. Sorry, they're a little out of line. Those things they should be a bit higher. Uh, but, you know, send so much data out of path one, send so much data out of port two, everything else should just stay local to the box. What about layer two failover? What happens if flow normally goes via port one, but during port three during a failure? Then you can configure it so that the flow works that way by just having a failback rule. So here, normally layer two switching out of port one, and the second one layer two switching out of port two. But if either of those ports fail, then send it out of port three. That's a redundancy condition. Similar sort of thing for policy routing. Those of you who've been configuring policy-based routing to get granular, more granular control or classification of your system, you can do similar sorts of things in flows. I think you could, by now, you should be able to see that flows can be used to program different ways of achieving everything. This basically says, Everything from a source of 10.1.16 sending that to 192.168 send it out port 1. You'd need a bigger network architecture to make sense of that, but inside of a flow table of a single device, this is what you would have. And finally, load balancing. What does load balancing look like? Load balancing is where we would instantiate a pipeline. So that is, you would obviously have to receive the frame. In this case, in the first line, we actually receive the frame and rewrite the header. In other words, receive the packet on the VIP and then rewrite the TCP IP address so that it's now being sent to this server. And then the pipeline then puts it through again, saying you're now being load balanced to 192.168.1 on port 1 and then egressing that out port 1. Correspondingly, if the flow table said you want to look at a different destination, you would then use the second line. And that uh, flow scale capability is now something that's being quite popular. There are software applications of this today. Okay. So the sorts of things that flow tables will solve is the business cases where you say things like, I want my SAP traffic to have a priority, but no more than 20%. In this is case, the open flow, flow tables would say, this is how much traffic there is, and it would have to gain a, a feedback loop from here. Then do this. The next one is something that the big cloudy providers are all excited about. So the Googles and the Yahoos are saying things like, if my Hadoop cluster is running, then allocate a set of dedicated paths through my network for it. Move all other traffic off those links and just clear my Hadoop clustering path so that I can hammer it down. And that's very popular, especially amongst the Googles and Yahoos, because this means that they can use software to reconfigure their entire network. And all they do is punch in a set of flow commands from right across the system, and they can reconfigure the way the network looks. And finally, the business case is that every a security business case, which says every IP flow has a matching security policy. And that security policy is then matched to a flow entry. So before a server can ever send a packet from a server to another server, before it even hits the ingress point at the edge of the network, it's already been matched to a policy in the, in the controller. Uh, this is network access control taken to its extraordinary limit and uh, probably the most exciting. And indeed, if rumors are to be believed, that's where it came from, the actual source of NetFlow. The original idea was uh, out of a security research project for one of the government departments said, how do we secure it right at the very edge? It's since morphed into how do we create virtual networks out of our existing networks. The stories have changed, but it depends on who you're talking to in the OpenFlow community as to which one came first. And I think the story varies depending on who you are, which is, isn't surprising. Okay. I just want to point out that OpenFlow is just kind of dumb, right? 
OpenFlow is not the smart part of this system. OpenFlow is an API and a protocol that passes between the controller and the network device. So this means that the controller does everything. The controller is the smart, it's the engine. The flow tables themselves are, as they go into the device, is clever. And, and, and it's going to be very important to be able to know how the flows get into the FIB table and how many flows and how it interoperates with your OSPF and your BGP. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of issues there. Let's not get, that's very important. Each network device and its functionality is vital. But the answer is the controller really does everything. And we'll talk more about controllers in the second half. So when we talk about flows, there's a few, as I've talked to people over the last six months about OpenFlow, there's a few sort of typical errors in perception. You don't need a flow entry for every MAC address or IP address or TCP protocol. Today, we have flow forwarding in our networks in the terms of FIB tables, and it's usually done at the subnet to subnet level, or if you're in a switch, it's done at the MAC to MAC. Right? So it doesn't mean you actually have to define the flow in every single table and every part of that you know, that actual flow entry. You don't actually have to have everything filled. Most of it's using uh, wildcards. In some networking designs, forwarding entries will rarely change. So if you could imagine you have a router network, most of the time, 24 hours a day, our routing tables are static and our FIB tables for packets never change. It's only when a reconvergence in the network happens that that's a problem. You could certainly design an open flow implementation that looks exactly like that. Okay. You can use cascading flow tables to create alternate pathing. So active path, standby path. You can use load balancing to create by defining source and destinations to say some down this path and some down that path. That's roughly equivalent to equal path, equal cost routing using standard routing protocols because they do the same thing. They load the same data into the FIB. We're just not using an OSPF to decide how to do that load balancing. In the future, devices could handle large number of OF updates. One of the challenges, of course, is can controllers generate the algorithms fast enough and then deliver the OpenFlow FIB entries, the OpenFlow updates, down to a device at speed. And then, of course, the device itself must understand and accept OpenFlow commands and load them to the FIB within a certain period of time. And, and that performance loop is yet to be uh, well understood, especially across a wide range of vendors. But you could certainly design a network today that doesn't need large numbers of open flow updates. So for example, if you look at what NEC is achieving with their programmable flow, they are talking about thousands of entries per second with open flow. But the question would be, why would you want to do that? So updating flow tables is difficult and will take some time to prove reliability. I perceive it as a major problem. But again, you can design around it. And I would imagine that people who are smarter than me are already working on it. Or at least I hope there would be. Okay. So flow routing. Every flow can be set up by a controller and you can have exact match entries and in fine grain control. It's very suitable for edge access layer for firewall load balancing style applications. But aggregation, where you start to use aggregated control entries, you use a lot of wildcard flow entries on the right there. The flow table has a limited number of entries per flow group and might be more suited to a core backbone layer or a standard routing switching environment. So what I'm saying here is that there are two types. You could have flow routing, that is every very fine grained exact match flow entries with fine grained control could be well suited to an edge and an access layer where every single flow is mapped. But you might want to use a combination of fine grained control against aggregate control where aggregate control in the core just has more wider routing. It just says this subnet goes that way, this subnet goes that way. And that's more of a backbone layer where we focus on high performance. Anybody looking at that, and if you're thinking about today's model of core edge routing requirements, you'd be exactly right. So OpenFlow has similar requirements in this sense. It would be possible to have a very you know, tight core, which changes rarely, and a very dynamic edge, which is exactly how we define our networks today. I also want to talk about the differences between reactive and proactive flow generation. So during those flow tables, we said there might be entries in the flow table which say punt this to a controller. And there's two ways to look at flow generation by the controller, which is to look at it as reactive. So that is the receipt of any 
of the frame or a packet automatically gets handed to a controller and a, con and a flow entry is created. In other words, if there's something that doesn't match a flow, then everything gets punted to the controller for handling. That would assume you would have a reasonably small flow table and that you could accept the latency of while the packet's punted to the controller and the flow resultant flow entry comes back. That the, and this also means that your controller availability is absolutely vital. And obviously, in networking today, you know, where we have controller-based networking in terms of supervisors and line cards, and we already have performance problems inside of those, that's an issue and not yet to be seen. But there are use cases. There are software applications where this makes perfect sense. And that's because OpenFlow is a general purpose. But if you look more at a proactive flow generation model, which is on the right side of the slide here, the controller generates flow tables for an architecture. So the controller says, this is the overall architecture of the network. Let's work out the flow tables and then send them down to the device. And they use a lot more wildcard flow entries. It's much lower latency because everything's pre-configured ahead of time. It's less flexible, it's less dynamic, but it is working well. Okay, so a few discussion points that perhaps you'd like to take away is NetFlow might offer you some freedom from hardware vendors. It might give you the op opportunity to um, change the way your networking equipment looks. And it may be possible to buy very cheap hardware or very dumb hardware as part of your networks that have OpenFlow support. But it's also possible to buy very complex feature-rich firmware which also includes OpenFlow support. I, I want to throw this out there because a lot of people are taking the post-apocalyptic view that OpenFlow will kill off all the networking vendors in the world and everything will become a white box networking element. And that will be true for some people because OpenFlow could actually say all of the smart processing is up in the, in the engine. But in reality, um, we're probably going to see OpenFlow support added to the vendors. And certainly companies like Juniper and HP are a part of this camp where they're saying, OpenFlow, sure, you want to program our equipment using OpenFlow, we'll write an API and we'll provide that connectivity today and you can send OpenFlow to us. You can develop your controllers and do what you like, we'll support those types of features. It's possible to buy the other end of it, which, and there are companies out there like Pika 8 who are making very, very cheap and very, very dumb hardware that have OpenFlow support at a very, very low price. And that is also an answer for some people. To get more information about IPSpace webinars, please visit ipspace.net.